space saving capability and it's like half cheap. <laughs> we don't even have, have a blank a backside, so isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Just wonderful. Yeah. Annette had suggested that maybe I should put it on a card and just <laughs> hand out little five by sevens, and three by fives. And so, all right, this morning I would like to cover, and there are sheets back there. Question already? Yes, yes, yeah. So your question then would be what? That he would what now? What's that God would give to the unbeliever according to the evil of their deeds? Well, that's a reference, of course, to the law and the judgment that he rightly deserves, right? But. God wants to avoid that, and the only way to avoid that would be through, through the gospel, correct? Well, yeah, but David prayed that in, in the Psalms. He did, he did, and, and he was praying that the Lord's justice would be done in these situations, but I don't think those are opposite in the sense that if somebody, if, if, if the enemies of Jesus reject him, then that is their deserve fate and you always pray for the Lord's justice too to be done in situations but uh, that, I don't think that excludes the idea that he wanted their souls saved. Um, you know, consider the words that he spoke to the Pharisees during his ministry, particularly the last couple of weeks and he spoke words of harsh judgment, woe to you, woe to you and yet at the same time they were among that group that he wept over and prayed that they had not rejected him. So you have that element that, you know, you have to have the law. I've always said to you, without the law, you're not going to truly appreciate the gospel, are you? You're not even going to understand the gospel. You're not going to feel a need for the gospel, are you, without the law? So that, that threat, if you will, of punishment is also vital and important to the presentation of God's word, too. And, and we do that as well. I think every time we uh, recognize the law and speak of the law, we acknowledge that this is God's justice at work, right? Through the law. But what the law is supposed to do is create in our hearts a recognition of our need, our deep spiritual need for forgiveness, for a savior, and all of that. So I, I think that law and gospel both play their role. I've often compared it in confirmation to at the diagnostic end of, you go to a doctor, you're not feeling well, you go to a doctor. He's got two objects in mind. One is to figure out what's wrong. That's the diagnostic end of things. And he has to do that before he can apply any kind of healing medication or recommendation to you. He has to know what's wrong. So the law is kind of a spiritual diagnostic tool that helps people understand what's wrong with them spiritually, sin. And then the gospel can come in and provide that help and that healing. So I've always liked that illustration of the law being a diagnostic tool and the gospel being a healing tool. And uh, so both are, both are important. Nobody's going to either feel a need for um, getting better or, or know how to get better unless you know what's wrong. And so the problem with most people is they don't either recognize the seriousness of their own sin or what God says about their sin or the consequences of their sin. So there's where the law comes in and it helps them. I don't know if that helps or not. Sometimes I think the more I talk, the more your mind will drift and we'll forget about it. Yeah, I, I believe that's what the Lord says is going to happen. And all we're doing, you know, this, this idea, don't judge anyone. We're never judging anyone. Um, we can judge wrongly, but when a Christian speaks the law to somebody, it's a word of judgment, but it's not our judgment. It's not our personal judgment. We're simply giving to that individual what they need uh, from the Lord. 
So they may need law, you know, and they're individuals who, if they don't know their, the seriousness of their sin, what they need is to know that, don't they? So that's, that's the whole idea, to create the environment for the gospel. Um, this section here comes from 1 Corinthians 15, that wonderful resurrection chapter that talks about the factualness and the significance of Christ's resurrection. And uh, in this particular section, which I think is not very familiar to many Christians, um, we have a description, probably the most detailed description in scripture, of the resurrection body. And uh, would someone please read the opening verses there, 35 to 37? See? But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body will they come? Foolish one, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps a wheat, So this section could have come about in response to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and others who denied the resurrection of the body, denied, of course, the resurrection of Christ. Um, when, when the apostle addresses them as foolish one, those are pretty strong words. Uh, there were those in their midst who were questioning the resurrection, including the resurrection of Christ. So he begins, I've got four, generally four questions after each section. My first question is, if a seed is never planted, what will become of it? It will dry up, it will wither and die. Yep, it won't do what it was intended to do. What does it take for a seed to germinate? Well, before, before that, you need something else. You need to plant it <laughs> in the ground. And so that is the key. And then, of course, the elements, the rain and the nutrition of the soil and everything come in to play, which, by the way, all of which come from the Lord, too, don't they? Those are things that come from Him. Uh, probably much easier to understand back in our, the days. Uh, I, I think when I graduated from seminary, somebody said that 75% of the CLC was rural, agricultural. I would venture to say it's probably 80% uh, city right now, right? Uh, hard to tell. Um, anyway, how does that apply to Christ's body and saving work, the seed concept? Anybody remember John 12, 24? I won't have you look it up, but it basically Jesus says there, except a grain of wheat die, uh, it remains a seed. But if it dies, or if it's planted into the ground, it produces much fruit. And he was speaking in that section of his own body. Unless I die for you and for the sins of the world, I will be no good. My very purpose in coming is to die for you. So he compares his own death to the planting of the seed. And it's a, really an interesting thought. Um, how does this apply to our present bodies? And that would be the most important in the first way. But how about in death? I mean, how about if we, don't, if we don't go through the, what I could call the death transformation process, we will never become what God designed and intended us to be. And, we have to, and we'll see more about that as we go along here. So let us, um, let's read the um, next section, 38 to 41, somewhere. Sam? All right, so uh, the question's below. Who gives each creature its own kind of body, form of matter? God does. So in his creation, you see evidence, don't you, of God giving to different creatures, different parts of his creation, different time, types of material makeup. 
And he talks about, uh, the second question I have is, what two different kinds of body contrast does Paul use to illustrate this truth? Yeah, you have, first of all, the contrast between human bodies and animal bodies. You have that here. And then you also have the contrast between heavenly and earthly bodies. And the commentators are kind of struggle with this a little bit because I have understood this always to refer, in the sense, to the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, those that are out in the universe. And the earthly bodies, those bodies that he puts here. So the body, the makeup, the material makeup of the sun, the moon, and the stars is way different than the material makeup of the things and the creatures that God made here on Earth. Likewise, the makeup of the animal bodies is different from the makeup of the human body in, in a lot of ways. So the point being made is that God makes different kinds of bodies in his creation for, that, for their special purpose that they serve. Uh, we would not exist or much less survive without the heavenly bodies doing what they think, what their thing is, the sun particularly. We, uh, and likewise on earth, all of the bodies of the other creatures serve their purpose as well. So that's the contrast that's being uh, drawn here. And I, I think of you know, the changes, for example, that take place within the bodies themselves, the variations. You know, God, uh, that distinction between kind and species. For example, God created the dog kind. But within that dog kind, you've got all these different species, right? Uh, and you cannot, and that's one of the fallacies of evolution, is that you cannot jump kinds. You cannot uh, you know, interbreed different kinds. You can't breed a dog and a cat and a bird and an elephant. You can't breed outside the kind. You can interbreed with the different species to create new species, but you can't breed outside the kind. And that makes evolution absolutely scientifically and biologically impossible, doesn't it? And so you have those variations. And I think also of you know, one of my high school class reunions, um, they, everybody brought along a baby picture. And uh, we had only 11 in my class, my, one of my early ILC classes, high school. And guess how many baby pictures of our classmates we could identify? None. I couldn't identify one. Uh, well, yeah, probably my own. Outside of my own. Thank you. Very much. But identifying it, 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 it's interesting how we change. So there's also variation within the body as it goes through life and as the effects of sin uh, and aging take their toll on the body, too. You have those changes. Let's go to verses 42 and 44, which now enter a very familiar section. Um, someone want to read those? Where have you heard those words before? Right here. Right <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what occasion or event connected with Christian death do you hear these words? Because this is a quote that is used in, a, in an element of the death service. What part? Committal. The committal service. Yeah. Pastor Pfeiffer read these words on Friday when down at the committal service for the Dolezals. And uh, we hear them there. They are some extremely powerful words. And I don't have questions here, but I'd like you to look at the contrast between, here the apostle is drawing a contrast between our earthly bodies and our heavenly bodies. The body at death uh, it is sown. It's planted into the ground in corruption. Uh, in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So in other words, corruption means death and decay. That's how the body is placed into the ground. When it's raised from the dead, it will have incorruption. No death, no decay. 
When the body is placed in the ground, it is done so in dishonor. It is uh, repulsive. It is disgraced, the, the body of death. It wasn't the way that God intended things to be. However, when that body is raised up, it will be raised in glory. It will be perfect, radiant, beautiful. Um, the question I often got during my ministry is what age or stage of life will we be in heaven? And I'll tell you up front, the Bible does not answer that question. However, it may have some hints in the sense that what stage of life did God create Adam and Eve? Young. Young in their prime, if you will, correct? So that prime of life may be the ultimate goal that the Lord has for us, but we don't have that question answered clearly in Scripture. But, um, you know, there is a stage, and if I ask you what's the prime of life, you probably have to look at athletes, and their prime is probably between 24 and 27 or 28. That's the prime, so to speak, of athletics. So we don't know, but it will be perfect in every way. Um, if we die in very old age, where our body has really experienced the effects of sin and aging, um, that body will be raised perfect and glorious. And what a wonderful promise that is for each of us. Then that body that is planted in death in weakness, that is, is there anything more powerless or helpless than a dead body? It cannot do anything. It cannot bring itself back from the dead and everything less than that it cannot do as well. However, when that body is raised up, it will be in power. It will be energized. There will be no sin limitations whatsoever to that body. And this is the last one is the phrase I used to struggle with and nobody ever explained it to me when I was young. Uh, when I heard that expression at the cemetery, it is so in a natural body, it will be raised a spiritual body. I often wondered, what does that mean? Well, it is sown a natural body. Our bodies right now, as we live on planet Earth, those bodies are sin-affected in every imaginable way. Our bodies and our minds. Not just our souls, right? They're all affected by sin, just as the creation is. And when they're raised up, they will be spiritual bodies. And I remember thinking to myself, that's almost an oxymoron. How can it be a body and be spiritual? because the spiritual refers to the soul. But I have come to understand this, and others have helped me with this, that the spiritual body refers to the body that is completely under the control of the spirit in heaven. In other words, my spiritual body will be a body that is perfectly in harmony with God's will and, and God's desire and singing God's praises and glorifying God in every imaginable way my body will also be part of that, uh, my, my life that serves and glorifies God in eternity. So the spiritual body will be one under 100% control of uh, God's spiritual uh, nature that he has given to me. I will have a perfect soul and a perfect body in heaven. Is that how you've understood that phrase? Butch. The story is told of a lady that um, she was always serving at church potlucks and she would uh, always, they'd finish the meal and clean the dishes off and she'd always say to them, keep your fork. And you keep your fork because the ladies are going to bring out some pie or some cake or something wonderful like that. <laughs> and so when her funeral was conducted, her family insisted that she be buried with a fork. And the message that they gave was, the best is yet to come. So just like we keep our forks at meals for that glorious dessert that, that they have prepared for us, so also keep your forks. <laughs> um, the best is yet to come. And I, I do, that's the sense in which I believe it's meant here. All right, now, in my, uh, in my aging process here, I omitted a couple of verses without even realizing it, believe it or not. But I omitted verses 45 and 46, which basically say this. Um, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural is first, and afterward the spiritual. The first Adam became a living being. The last Adam 
was it has a life-giving spirit. So the contrast is between our bodies. First we have our natural bodies here on earth, then we will have our spiritual bodies in heaven, right? Those perfect bodies. Um, and also, the first body became a living being. Adam was created as a living being. But the last Adam, and Paul is the one that uses that phrase, the second Adam or the last Adam, and that refers to whom? To Jesus. Uh, the first Adam failed the test. The second Adam passed the test for us as our Savior, and now he promises these blessings to us. And he's a life-giving spirit, right? Adam was not a life-giving spirit. In fact, because of sin, uh, all he could bring into the world in his descendants was death. But he is a life, uh, Jesus is a life-giving spirit. All right, having said that, let's move on to 47 to 49. Uh, Joel, you want to read that? So my question is, whose bodies are here contrasted as from dust and from heaven? Adam and Jesus. Adam and Jesus is correct. <clears throat> so there we have, you know, Adam came from dust, Jesus came from heaven. He was sent from heaven and God the Father uh, sent his only begotten son and he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the bodies that they have came from different places. And the second question pertaining to this is, whose bodily image are we patterned after now, and whose bodily image will we be patterned after in heaven? Adam and Jesus. Adam and Jesus again. How are we patterned after Adam, the first Adam? Yep, born in sin, soul-wise, and also <clears throat> born into sinning and dying bodies as well. <clears throat> so the second Adam, uh, his image is what we'll have in heaven. Um, the, body, the Bible passage that I've listed here, first, or excuse me, Philippians 3.21, um, who can finish this one? <clears throat> uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly, earthly bodies or lowly bodies, to make them like unto his glorious body, according to the power by which he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So that's a wonderful passage. It speaks of our bodies being transformed. And our bodies are indeed transformed uh, at the resurrection. <clears throat> so that's a beautiful thought. They will be fashioned after the body of Christ. Um, how will our bodies then be like Christ's body after the resurrection? Gary. Well, um, can one go so far as to say because Christ uh, ate after he uh, was uh, resurrected <clears throat> that uh, we will also eat? And because Christ uh, could uh, see that we will also see in heaven? I mean, can you draw those conclusions? when it says, like Christ's body, yeah. uh, when Christ came through the wall um, and appeared to the disciples, will we have that ability to do the things like that as well? I don't know the answer to that. However, I would say the key, the key parallel would be he had a perfect body that's glorified. And that's what we will have, correct? Now to go further than that, I don't know that we have scripture support for that. So the emphasis would be wrong. Right. But rather that our, our transformed body would have the same quality. That's correct. And when you ask about eating, though, I've always thought to myself, you know, that is, I've thought the same thing you did about his eating, that he ate with them not only to show he was alive and real, but also perhaps to give us a glimpse. And as one who truly loves food, as one of God's greatest blessings in life, earthly blessings, um, I, I like to think we'll be eating in heaven. And some of the women in my life say the only thing they know for sure, certain is there'll be no white castles in heaven. 
So I can't speak for that because I'm a White Castle guy. So, but the, I've only met one woman that would ever accompany me to such a place. And, uh, not my wife. So, um, but I do believe, you know, why is God raising up our bodies? Because that's the way that he intended us to live with him forever in the first paradise. And consider again how often God says in scripture, um, the new heaven and the new earth, that is, that is replacing the current heaven and the current earth. The new heaven and the new earth. And the interesting thing about that is the word new. There's two words in the Bible for new. Brand new, 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 and renovated or remodeled new. Guess which word is used regarding the new heaven and the new earth? The renovated. So in other words, it's going to be patterned after the original. That leads me to believe that you know, our life will be very much like the Garden of Eden, uh, the paradise that's described in the Garden of Eden. And he's raising up our bodies because we're going to serve and glorify him in so many wonderful ways. I know one of the things that the kids used to say in confirmation was, you know, Pastor, you're, you talk about heaven and it really sounds wonderful, but one thing concerns me. And you know what concerns a seventh and eighth grader? Boredom. <laughs> and so they have this picture of heaven where we're all be sitting around the throne, either stringing a harp or, you know, listening to a, you know, eternal sermon, if you will. Um, but they got these misconceptions and we will be busy and active. We glorify and serve God, not just with the words and hymns and songs that we sing to him, but also the way that we live our lives. And we're going to be glorifying him with our bodies in lots of wonderful ways. So I tell them, and they didn't believe me, of course, that there's going to be no boredom in heaven. And I, furthermore, I told them, you remember that, Joel? Boredom is not God's problem or my problem. Boredom is your problem. You're bored because you're not interested in things, right? So get with the program. Um, so, something like that, right? Yeah, something like that. All right, let's go on with, um, yeah, any more questions? Diane. Well, remember, heavens and earth is used. You're going to answer that, aren't you, Sam? Heaven is often referred to as the place where God is. And then you create the new heaven and the new earth. Um, that would be the paradise. Yeah. Yeah, so in other words, heaven is not always in the Bible used in the sense of our eternal home. It's also used often with earth together to refer to the universe and earth. Like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a reference to the universe, isn't it? And so that expression is used, and I would say it seems to indicate that we're going to have a new or remodeled or transformed uh, heaven and earth or universe that we're going to be living in, uh, in eternity. And again, that idea of transformation. But let's go on with uh, 50 to 52 here. Uh, Barb, I know you had your hand up last time. No, this So, I have a question, I guess. Um, well, the first question below is why can our bodies, as they currently are, why can they not ever enter heaven in their present state? They are imperfect. They are impacted by sin. Um, and there's a parallel here with the creation in Romans chapter 8. The Lord says, I can't take that old heaven and earth, that old universe, that old earth, I can't take that into heaven either as our eternal home because that's also contaminated and corrupted by sin, right? And so I'm going to recreate. And again, I believe, based on the original language, that it means I will transform or recreate a new heaven and a new earth patterned very much after that perfect original in the Garden of Eden. And uh, so I, I believe that's what's meant there. Um, also, um, 
The expression is used here that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. When you run across that expression, flesh and blood, what does that mean to you? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Our earthly bodies, but it also, you know, it's used sometimes in scripture to refer to our sinful nature too, isn't it? So something that, again, is sinful and contaminated and polluted and dying, that can't be a part of God's perfect paradise in heaven. So that's why just as the universe itself will have to be destroyed in order that God can create a new heaven and a new earth, so also our physical bodies must go through the death process, unless we're alive at the end of the world, they must go through that death process in order to be transformed. It's the planting again uh, of that seed of our lives that will, of our bodies that will bring forth the eternal blessing. Um, question number two, who are those sleeping and those not sleeping on the last day? No. I'm hearing about 18 different answers here. That's correct. And not sleeping. Who are alive. Yep. So you've got two groups of people when Christ returns. You've got those who have already died, those believers that are sleeping, and I love the biblical description of death as a sleep because it describes the body in the condition between the death and the resurrection. And sleep is a wonderful thing. If you sleep well, that's one of God's greatest gifts, right? Uh, it's a gift. Uh, but if you really sleep well, let's say you fall asleep at 11 o'clock at night and you wake up at 7, how conscious are you of the passing of time? Now, you wake up, and that's the way it will be for those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Uh, that will be what that will be like at the resurrection. Uh, those who are alive, at the time Christ returns, their bodies also will be transformed, right? They will be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that will all happen. Um, how is our resurrection future a mystery? It, it says, behold, I tell you, a mystery. You know, that's used a lot in the Bible. How is all of this a mystery? Because we don't know when it will happen? That's part of it. We can't understand it unless the Lord opens our eyes and our heart through Scripture to, to know it. So to the world, to the unbeliever, it's not, uh, it's not something that they will understand. But it's again a mystery. Many things in the Bible are called a mystery. But they're not a mystery to us who the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to see and understand. But a mystery is something that can only be revealed to you by someone else and that's God himself has revealed it to us. Um, the next question, will we have new bodies at the resurrection or will they be the same <coughs> with a divine makeover? <clears throat> Maybe I shouldn't have used that word makeover. <laughs> you know, when you get to be my age, you can use those words, right? Anyway, I know I'm in need of one, but. There you go. What does that tell you, Sam? Well, that it will be our own bodies. Yeah. And I think of our own bodies, again, that like the baby picture to many years later. Think of our own bodies transformed over the years. But this will be the great positive transformation that will take place at that time. You and I will call it that, Gary. The rest of them maybe don't like that term, but yeah, yeah. I, I guess so. I'm, I'm not an expert on what the word makeover truly means. <laughs> so can we also conclude that, that the, uh, those that are not saved will not experience the, uh, the transformation in their body? That's a really good question. I, we, you know, that... Hell is never presented as any kind of a positive transformation, right? So I don't know how that will work, but we're told that they will um, live forever in, under God's judgment in eternity. Um, and that will be, and that's body and soul. 
And uh, the thing that's portrayed in scripture about hell, you know, in, in our lives right now, if pain becomes so great, we pass out, right? There's, there's, a, there's a relief uh, that takes place. But in hell, it's presented as the worm will never be quenched. There will be no relief. And the greatest agony will be, you know, I mentioned this in the sermon about guilt. I believe the unbeliever's greatest uh, agony will be the spiritual agony of being separated from God because apart from God, there's nothing good. There's no blessing. There's, it's just the consequences of sin carried to the nth degree, right? That's what it will be like for the unbeliever, and that's why it's so important to, that we want anybody and everybody that we know and everybody else to learn about their Savior. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, but they don't know it comes from God. Right? That's a, that's a really good point because the Bible says God you know, makes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the believer and the unbeliever. So they, they do enjoy many blessings and those will be gone. Yeah. I think also the fact that they will know that they rejected God and that guilt is... Yes. I think that's going to be... Yeah. 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 And they'll want a second chance and unfortunately there is no such thing. Butch? How many, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, because I know you'll say I'll get back to you. But... <laughs> I'll get back to you, Butch. There are a lot of, of those that speak of judgment and condemnation and banishment from the presence of God, that kind of thing. There are a lot of those. Sam, you have something? Yeah. The other thing about that account is that it's just a parable and it has to teach a lesson. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I don't know if we can really take a lot of that. We can't press the details of that parable too far. Uh, however, the agony, you know, will, will you send Lazarus to provide a, just a touch of water on my tongue kind of gives us an idea of the agony, right? Of hell, you have that certainly there, but them talking back and forth is something, like Sam said, that I don't think is part of the intent of the parable itself. It doesn't seem that way based on scripture. Eternity is, I mean, who can fathom that? Martin Luther once said that if you, you took the Swiss Alps, he said, a bird came once every 10,000 years and took a peck at the entire Alps chain. When that bird had succeeded uh, in wearing down the entire Swiss Alps mountain chain, then one second of eternity would have passed. So, I mean, who can comprehend this yeah. eternity forever? But forever life is so important, and it's determined by this life response to the gospel, isn't it? And that's the sense of urgency that we need to have regarding all who know not. All right, um, when will this great change occur? I think we've talked about that already, right? Yeah, Judgment Day, when Christ returns. And let's read the last uh, two verses here. Now, this is familiar, because this is, this is Easter readings. <laughs> Someone? Yes. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that So what additional characteristic will believers put on in eternity that's mentioned here? Now we've talked about the corruption already. 
immortality. What is immortality? Yeah, if, if mortality is death, then immortality is deathlessness, right? <coughs> Living forever. So we will put that on, and it will be forever, and it will be wonderful, beyond description, forever. Um, then the full effect of Christ's uh, Good Friday death and his Easter victory uh, will come to pass. Death is swallowed up in victory. I love that expression swallowed up in victory. There's something ultra-permanent and final about being swallowed up. Death will not come back to haunt us. Sin will not be a part of our existence. So many of you may remember back to your confirmation days, what three kinds of death does the Bible talk about? Oh. Caitlin. Why are you crawling under the pew? <laughs> All right, what three kinds of death does the Bible talk about? Mortal death would be physical death. Spiritual death is what? The soul not, you know, being not a believer. Uh, so you're spiritually, once you come into this world in sin, you're spiritually dead. Baptism changes that. But yeah, and then ultimately the third kind? Eternal death. All of us must go through, unless we're alive at the end, the first kind of death. Uh, the Holy Spirit has spared us from the second kind of death, and if that is the case, if we're believers, then we are blessed among those who die in the Lord, and we will not experience the third kind of death as well. So it's interesting. Um, I always, uh, that, that expression, the... Uh, and I'll read that in a section, a second to close, but talking about death having a sting. Uh, I remember reading a story of a, of a girl that was in a car with her dad, and he was driving, and apparently it was a bee in the car, and she was panicking and getting all scared, and somehow he trapped the bee and, and pulled the stinger off the bee. He told her, you don't have to worry about the bee anymore. And the bee was still flying around, and she was still kind of scared. But because the bee had lost its stinger, it couldn't hurt her. And that's kind of a picture of death, isn't it? It's still buzzing around trying to scare us, but it's lost its stinger, and it can't hurt us anymore. So that's the picture that Jesus uh, portrays for us there in those final words. And before I read those, I guess, I also was uh, always struck by Luther uh, and some of the language he used um, in a, one of his um, songs, Chris Log. Let's see. Yeah, Chris Lag in in Todas Banda. Thank you, Mr. German. Um, so, yeah, Christ Jesus lay in death strong bands in that hymn. It talks about two. And in his writings, he called death in German ein Spat, which is a joke or a farce. And uh, so, in that in that uh, song too, it's there. It's presented that way. Death is really it's our last great enemy. That's for sure. But having lost its sting and having been overcome by Christ, we have the full assurance of victory uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I preached in Eau Claire a couple weeks ago, and I, I mentioned this expression um, in the sermon, we won. And I said, uh, how many of you have, um, when's the last time that you said that in your life? We won. Maybe you remember back to your sports days, when you're playing games or sports, we won. You're part of a team and contributed. Now, if we say we won, it's probably our kids or our grandkids who are playing sports and we say we won. But you think about it, did we really win? What did we have to do with this victory? Christ did it, he did it alone, right? However, we can say we won, right? Because Everything that he did, he did in our place, he did for us, and the greatest thing, of course, was the victory that he won for us. And so with that, I'll read the final um, section here, very familiar to you. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
So any final questions on anything before we close? Uh, we'll close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, 